Warm welcome to you. You have been watching our Reporters Plus programme. In this edition, the untold story of the company that's uh, redefining your privacy. Uh, Clearview AI then for artificial intelligence is that New York-based uh, facial uh, recognition firm aiming to collect everyone's faces on the planet. Now, as you saw in that report in the US, uh, police use it to track criminals. In uh, Ukraine, it's been used to identify Russian spies. What happens, though, when a powerful tool like that falls into the wrong hands? Or you may say it has, in fact, already happened. Well, to unpack these uh, really fascinating uh, questions, I'm joined by uh, France 24's Jessica Lemazurier, who produced the report. Uh, she joins us from New York. Uh, Jessica, good to have you with us. I also have uh, here in the studio in Paris, Hi Peter. There. Hi there, Jessica. Uh, also here in the studio in Paris, we have Peter O'Brien from our uh, Tech 24 desk. Hello to you, Peter. Hi. Uh, we have uh, Hubert Etienne, a researcher in AI ethics at Meta, and uh, also a professor at HSE Paris. Good to have you with us, Hubert. And also uh, Charles Pierre Astolfi, uh, AI and uh, digital regulation expert. Good to have you all with us. Uh, a fascinating report we've all been saying here, uh, Jessica. If I come to you first in New York, I understand that the report has been a long, sometimes arduous uh, road, a huge amount of information collected. Uh, just walk us through, Jessica, what your motivation uh, for uh, producing a report like this was. Well, as well, you well know, I, I am France 24's New York correspondent and I report from New York City and also from the United Nations. So I usually cover diplomacy, geopolitics and also anything that's going on here in New York. And initially, this was just a news report about uh, police use of facial recognition technology. Uh, and I went to interview Clearview CEO Juan Tontat for that simple uh, feature story. Uh, I actually went to interview him twice and during the second interview, things got very, very tense. I started to ask him about his alleged ties to the far right and the conversation got very, very awkward. He became very evasive and ultimately he ended up completely turning his body and looking right away from me and he refused to look at me and stayed like that for an uncomfortably long time. Now, my camera woman was so nervous and uh, Clearview's comms person was telling us the interview was over, so she switched off the camera. So that moment is sort of very, with the camera jostling, uh, but it's very clear. And then she did keep rolling, but she was trying to desperately film some B-roll because we thought we were going to be kicked out of there. Uh, and under his breath, he just said to me, you're very good at reading people. Okay. And then we left. It was a really chilling atmosphere in the room and a few days later I had an email uh, from Clearview's PR agent telling me that if France 24 decided to air that part of the interview about the far right questioning Juan Tontat on his ties to the far right then our legal counsel was going to need to speak to theirs and when I got that email, I was absolutely terrified because I don't normally do investigative reporting for the network. Um, but Following that interview experience uh, and upon reading that email, I thought, wow, I really have stumbled across a story that is very important to tell. Um, I didn't dare reply to that email. I was afraid of legal repercussions. I wasn't, you know, I haven't faced that kind of thing before. Uh, and then shortly after that, I got a call from Clearview's PR agent offering me an exclusive if I dropped the story. Um, I then started to investigate and, and that's why this story exists today. You use the word, Jessica, chilling there. That's certainly a word that's echoed in the studio when, uh, you know, throughout the report, we saw these kind of facets of Clearview, uh, which were quite chilling, uh, revealed. Uh, Clearview maintains that ultimately uh, facial recognition, that it's, uh, you know, the work that it does has more advantages than risks. I, I want to bring you in here, Hubert. What do you think uh, about this, you know, idea that, in fact, the advantages outweigh the risks of what we saw in that report? Yeah. So clearly in this case, and as far as I'm concerned, I don't see any advantage. So I only see risks. And I don't even think we should talk about risk because we have clear proofs of abuses, which means that people use it in the wrong way, especially police forces, it's well documented. Uh, they also sometimes use it in the wrong way, not maliciously, but because they don't really know how to use the tool. So the training is insufficient in many cases. And you asked the question at the beginning, what if these falls under the wrong hands? I would ask you the question, what if it were developed from the wrong hands? 
And That's an interesting perspective. To, to my perspective, this is what's happening here. And the most um, maybe worrisome point is that governments are encouraging these practices because I don't know anyone who would say this is an ethical uh, company or anyone who would work for them. But um, the question is what happened when a company behaved this way and developed these kind of tools and the government encouraged it by using their tools. I mean, you use the word unethical there and uh, one of the, the guests that you interviewed, Jessica, in the programme, uh, Richard A. Clark, uh, one of the, the uh, kind of interviewees in the programme says, look, we don't do anything unethical, we don't do anything that's immoral. It's a thin line, though, and again, who measures immorality or what's unethical? Charles Pierre. So, no. so uh, I agree that unethical might have different definitions for different people, uh, but at least here in the EU, we have we know that what Clearview does is illegal. It's been fined several times by several countries in the EU um, because they were collecting this data uh, uh, unlawfully. Because you could not opt out of the service, uh, you could not ask to be to get out of their database. Um, so. Uh, not even speaking about what's ethical and what's not. It's clearly unlawful here in the EU, and they are still uh, doing their business here. So clearly, they just don't care about the law. So why should they care about the ethics then? I mean, Peter, you and I spoke uh, briefly earlier about you know th what this report does in terms of highlighting the questions that remain unanswered when it comes to Clearview AI. Yeah, one of my big questions is what's happening with the, the tech companies who sent de cease and desist letters to Clearview back in 2020. I mean, they've, okay, they've, they've said, uh, please remove all the images that you have in our database of our users. But beyond that, are we seeing any big lawsuits, any big fights? Um, not, not particularly. And I just like to uh, rebound on what you were saying, Uber, like, Yes, okay, maybe governments are, so suddenly the US government is encouraging it, but aren't tech platforms uh, like Meta's also encouraging it by having, um, you know, in the past had everyone's images publicly and now making it, um, you know, st still having it as an opt out for people to um, to have their profile as, uh, as private rather than public. So doesn't that, in a way, open the door to firms like Clearview to, to scrape all of their images? I mean, that's... That's one of my questions from it. I don't know. It's an interesting point. Well, remember that uh, kind of segment in the film where, um, you know, Jessica realises there's this picture of her that she didn't post on Instagram that, that's there. What does a, an application or facial recognition technology like this do to privacy? Or are we already living in a world where our privacy is so compromised that this really doesn't add a great deal to it? That's a good question. Uh, I think we changed... The word was very different. Also, you mentioned the use of facial recognition on, uh, on Facebook. It was one specific feature um, and quite controlled also, and it was like a long time ago. So I think we removed it one or two years ago, but it was being used in a very different context than the one we have today. So the question around privacy were very different from those we see today and the risk we have. We have much more maturity on, on this. I'm, I'm talking about the, the world in general instead of a reflection on this. And um, to get back to your question around privacy, I, I hope it's not gone. Uh, I think it's today that we need to defend it uh, very fiercely and otherwise it's all gone. But also we should understand that from a country to another it's very different. You were mentioning that the ethics changes. Uh, we don't have universal ethics. Maybe Kant would disagree with that, but mm. we don't have that. Uh, the people in Saudi, the people in the US, the people in France or in China, they don't have the same ethics and they don't have the same relationship with the government. And so, for instance, in China, whatever we may say about them, they have a much higher trust in the government that we do in France or in the US. And that changes the whole uh, context around the question. I, th I think so as well. I mean, if I bring you back in, Sharpiel, of course, you're a digital regulation expert. It'd be interesting to know how much social media you use and do you worry about your images uh, when you look at a report like that being uh, compromised or, or springing up in places that you never authorised them, them to be? How worried should we be about this type of thing? Well, um, well I think that you should be worried about being in Clearview database because uh, most probably uh, all of us here uh, already are. Um, that doesn't mean that you should stop using social media or you should go dark. Uh, Clearview is like the parox paroxystic um, application of facial recognition of artificial intelligence. But there are useful and ethical um, uses of 
social media and artificial intelligence systems. Um, so I think you must know the risk when you go out on the internet, when you post on social media, and you should always, always uh, weigh them. Um, maybe, maybe you just don't care, uh, but you have to know that the risk exists and that you are willing to take it because it, you consider that it's worth it. Willing to take the risk. Jessica, if I come back to you in, in New York. Uh, in terms of how uh, Clearview has kind of responded uh, to this, this investigation, uh, did you get a sense that, you know, any of this was being taken on board, the idea that this is, uh, you know, uh, tapping into people's lives and, and, and really quite, uh, what's the word? It, it, it's, it, it's allowing people to have no privacy ultimately. Well, I think that the way that Clearview is uh, scraping what is essentially biometric data without consent should be extremely worrying to all of us, uh, particularly in view of the fact that, as you see in my report, uh, the people running this firm have got deep ties uh, to members of the far right and have been active in those circles themselves. That should be of concern to all of us, especially uh, as there really are no regulations in the United States, almost no regulations at all on this kind of data scraping and on the use of this technology. Uh, so until there are some kind of uh, extra safeguards, uh, this is really important for us to know exactly how our information is being used. Uh, I also... Yeah, I really just wanted to raise public awareness of, of what is going on so that we don't sort of sleepwalk into a situation without being uh, aware of how this technology can impact us. I do want to stress that I don't think that facial recognition technology is bad per se. I think that it can be used for many good things. But what I do also think is that uh, we need to really have conversations about how it's used, how it's regulated, how our data is collected. Uh, we should uh, really be uh, allowed to uh, give consent for it to be used. We shouldn't just have it taken from us and used in ways that we're not even aware of. I mean, the, the issue of safeguarding, Peter, was uh, brought up in, in Jessica's report, you know, calls for safeguarding. W what does that look like ultimately? Because the, the, the task is absolutely huge yeah well we've seen uh, bans in countries and and uh, uh, that's one way to approach it but fundamentally if you're still being scraped from the internet there's there's not much you can do however i would say that advancements in a generative ai uh, could do two things to facial recognition if you look at it from a negative point of view you could potentially have um, bad actors uh, authoritarian regimes for instance or criminals uh, could potentially generate a lot of faces that look like yours, put them on the internet and point to that as a way of perhaps framing you. That's very much a, um, that would be the worst case scenario of how that could be used uh, in conjunction with um, a facial recognition. But on the other side, you can imagine a sort of tool or a service that uploads millions of uh, faces that look almost exactly like yours in a way to sort of, what would the word be? Um, uh, blur the lines on which face is actually yours. So if law enforcement cannot reasonably trust that the images that they're coming across on the internet are actually yours, which, I mean, we're already seeing millions and millions of generated faces appear on the internet every day with their new AI tools. You can imagine that perhaps being a way to counteract uh, facial recognition technology. Not that I've seen anything like that emerge as of yet. I mean, surely, Hubert, this is going to give rise to, and you touched on it earlier, you know, people uh, being held uh, when, in fact, they're entirely innocent. And, you know, cases like this uh, coming up as we see this uh, facial recognition technology it expanded, so to speak. Yes, absolutely. And I think um, you're very right to mention generative AI here because it can go very wrong or it can also be a tool we can use to actually rethink the way we address this, uh, these issues. And especially today, uh, since we cannot trust anymore everything we see online and many pictures would not be considered as a proof anymore, uh, as an evidence anymore, that's something we can also use to um, think twice when we use these tools. So when the police, that, that's why I, I was putting some of the blame on the, on the authorities more than on the platforms, because we will never be able, anyone can do that. Today, two people can reproduce clear, um, clear view AI. So we cannot regulate it. We will never be able to do something good on this. But we have something which is important in the US, know, know your customers, KYC. And this is something that should also apply to authorities when they do that, because 
if they had, uh, if they only work with trustworthy and ethical companies, they send a signal to all the others. And also, if they implement practices to know when you have false positive, when you have false negatives, how do you audit your algorithms, the algorithms of the people you work with? This is also a strong signal for all the platforms working with them. Is that something you agree with, uh, Charles Pierre? Oh yes, um, much definitely. Um, in the end, AI is a technology that should be used for the benefit for the benefit of society at large. Um, but it's just a technology. So what actually matters is how we are using it. And so the bad ways and very good ways to actually use it. So um, I think that regulation is uh, required when it comes to AI. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually something that is ongoing in Europe. There is this uh, AI Act, which you which should pass by the end of the year. And that will prohibit actually some uses of AI technology that are considered too harmful for society. Stuff like um, social scoring, uh, facial, re facial recognition in real time in public spaces, um, tar using AI system to target uh, vulnerable people, or um, yes, that's, um, this will be prohibited, for example. And, there are other systems which we consider to be high risk. And in this case, they can be deployed uh, if you prove that you've put in place the right safeguards and uh, that you have uh, the right governance for your system. So there is a right way to do AI. OK, well, uh, just a very uh, quick answer from you, Jessica, because I know we're running out of, of time. Will this impact how you uh, live your life, having investigated this uh, for so long? Less or more social media? Or? Is this a question to me? Absolutely, it is, Jessica. How oh, is um, I don't really post that much on social media, especially as I have children. I don't like to uh, have their images on social media. I do think, uh, yeah, it will definitely have even more of an impact on me because I see quite how you can be profiled with this sort of artificial intelligence. And it was actually... Freddie Martinez, who really, we have Freddie Martinez to thank for discovering the existence of this firm, really, or for bringing it to the attention of the public. And he said, you know, we should all have the right to grow and change over time. And when you have a technology like this, a program like this, it sort of records everything about almost some of the most intimate details of your life. Over time, uh, you might be caught in a protest somewhere. Uh, a photo will be logged of you in that protest. Uh, there may be an image of you uh, walking into your doctor's office in the background of someone else's photo. All these images that could say a lot about your life and how you might change, and they will all be stored in this database, and they can be used, uh, indeed, to profile you. All right, Jessica, on that note, uh, we've come to the end of our Reporters uh, Plus special. I'd like to thank you, Jessica, in New York, uh, Peter here in the studio, uh, Charles-Pierre Astolfi for us, and also Hubert Etienne. Thanks so much for coming in to discuss uh, this uh, facial recognition technology. Thank you at home for watching.